Hello, and welcome to a lecture on Variable Frequency Synthesis. I'm Steve Ellingson. Here's an overview of this lecture. Previously, we considered ways to create a single fixed frequency, in particular using LC feedback oscillators. However, we often require the ability to adjust, or we say tune, the frequency. In this lecture, we'll address the three principal methods available in RF engineering to do that. The first is voltage-controlled oscillators, or VCOs. The second is phase-locked loop, or PLL, synthesizers. And the third method is direct digital synthesis, or DDS. So first, voltage-controlled oscillators. And a starting point I can use for this is the clap resonator, which I briefly introduced in a previous lecture. Uh, and the idea is that, again, we're starting with the feedback oscillator topology, and then we have to put a resonator in here in the feedback path. And one of the resonators that we focused on was coal pits, where we have an inductor oriented like this and two capacitors and the feedback is taken from the node between the capacitors. And there was also the Hartley method uh, where we had inductors in lieu of capacitors and vice versa. But let's take a look at the coal pits architecture. A modification that we talked about there was adding a third capacitor here in series with that inductor. Now anything that has resonance will be fine here and this will certainly have a resonance. So it's uh, clear that this will work as a resonator, but the issue is why would we add this third capacitor? And one reason is that uh, that's a convenient place to put a varactor. So here is the idea. If you take that third capacitor and replace it with a varactor, also known as a very cap, uh, that's a capacitor whose capacitance depends on an applied voltage. So what you can do is apply a bias across this capacitor, a DC bias, not an RF, but DC bias, and use that DC bias to change the capacitance of that diode. So in this way, you are changing the total capacitance in the tank circuit and thereby the resonance. So once again, the scheme is change the bias voltage across that diode, the capacitance changes in proportion to that bias, and then you've changed the resonance of the circuit, thereby retuning the oscillator. And that's really the essential idea behind a voltage-controlled oscillator. So this is not the only way to go. Many other topologies are possible. For example, you could have the varactor in parallel with the inductance. If whatever circuit you choose has LC resonance, that can probably be used. And if one of those elements in the resonator is a capacitor that can be implemented as a varactor, then it can be tunable. Now going forward in VCO design, uh, it gets quite complicated. Uh, certainly there's additional biasing requirements. The thing you have to do to properly bias and then control the bias of this varactor contributes a lot of complexity to the circuit. And also varactors have limitations. They're limited in how variable their capacitance can be and they have temperature sensitivities and so on. So the design of practical VCOs becomes quite complex. So we're not going to go any further with the design of VCOs in this course, although I will provide some additional resources to show you some uh, specific uh, case studies that uh, will show you just how VCOs are actually designed. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is phase locked loop synthesizers. So the starting point there is going to be the integer N PLL. It's the simplest form of PLL synthesizer that you can imagine. The essential idea here, before we get into this block diagram, is that first, there is a crystal oscillator. That crystal oscillator is right here in this diagram. And the role of that crystal oscillator is to provide frequency stability and accuracy. It is not able to tune. The second point is that there is a VCO here. VCO's role is to provide tunability. We just saw one way that can happen. Unfortunately, as a LC feedback oscillator, it has lousy stability and lousy accuracy. So the idea in a PLL synthesizer is to combine these two things, 
so that they each offset each other's limitations. Specifically, in a PLL synthesizer, the crystal oscillator is used to discipline the VCO, and that gives us the advantages of both stability and accuracy as well as tunability. So to show more explicitly how this works, I'll show you a very boring integer n PLL synthesizer. So in this integer n PLL synthesizer, I have a crystal oscillator. The frequency is divided by one. In other words, whatever frequency emerges here is here as well. There is a phase comparator. The role of the phase comparator is to compare the phase of the waveform that's applied here to the phase of the waveform that's applied here. Now, if we're comparing phase, that implies those frequencies should be equal because the phase of two waveforms with different frequencies is, of course, going to be continuously varying. So in order for a phase comparator to do something sane, the frequencies must be the same and so that the phases can be compared. What emerges from the phase comparator is a DC signal, which is proportional to the phase difference. And then because the phase comparator is not perfect, it has some noise, we apply a loop filter. And the purpose of the loop filter is to smooth out the control signal. So this thing has noise on it, and hopefully by the time we emerge from the loop filter, we have much less noise. And then this is the control voltage applied to the VCO. We take the output of the VCO and we feed it back. In this case, we just divide by one, meaning no change. And that's the input to the phase comparator. So we see here that whatever comes out of the VCO should be at the same frequency as whatever is coming from the crystal oscillator. Now, this is very boring because if we're going to do this, we might as well just take the output from the crystal oscillator. Uh, the VCO contributes nothing here. The idea in an integer NPLL synthesizer is to change these division ratios in such a way that we can accomplish tuning. So to summarize, the phase comparator compares the VCO to the output from the crystal oscillator, and the output voltage is proportional to the phase difference. The VCO frequency varies in response to this control voltage, and in that sense is phase locked. In other words, the VCO here has been disciplined. It's been disciplined to be phase locked to the crystal oscillator. And the loop filter ensures a smoothly varying control voltage. Now a useful PLL synthesizer. And here I'll just throw in some example values. Let's say I have a crystal oscillator, and that crystal oscillator is working at 40 megahertz. Let's say I divide that frequency by four. By the way, there's all kinds of ways to implement frequency division. A simple way is just to use a digital circuit which uh, does the division. So there's no special RF technology required here. It's uh, quite often just a digital counter that implements the division. And really, there's no special need for this to be sinusoidal. The crystal oscillator might produce an output sinusoid. Uh, this might be digital. It doesn't really matter because the phase comparator is only interested in phase. It's not interested in the specific form of the waveform. In any event, if I divide by 4, then at this point I have 10 megahertz. Now we know for the phase comparator to, to do something sane, the other input also has to be 10 megahertz. And here I've indicated that n, for this little example, will be 15. So that means it's dividing the frequency by 15, which means the frequency over here is 150 megahertz. So now we see how a PLL synthesizer can be used to cause the VCO to produce a stable and accurate signal at a frequency different from what the crystal oscillator reference is producing. And as we show here, that output will be 150 megahertz. So the question now is, how do we tune this thing? Well, the way we tune it, or one way we can tune it, is to change n. So for example, if I keep r equals 4, so that this is 10 megahertz, and I make n equal to 14 instead of 15, well then the output will be 140 megahertz. If I make n 15, I get 150 megahertz. If I make n 16, I get 160 megahertz.
So I tune in frequency by changing n. And by changing n, I get discrete frequencies, that is frequencies from a list. So n selects frequency, and f ref, that's this thing here, and r, the division ratio of the reference frequency, set the step size. So if I wasn't happy with this 10 megahertz spacing here, I would have to change f ref and r so that the ratio was something other than 10 megahertz. The phase comparator is a relatively complex chunk of electronics that exists in a PLL synthesizer, and it's worth saying something about how those could be implemented. This is a very common way to implement a phase comparator, certainly not the only way. It just, this is a method that appears a lot. It consists of two parts. Those two parts are a charge pump and a phase frequency detector. Let's look at the charge pump first. Well, first, here's the output of the phase comparator. That's that DC control signal that goes to the VCO eventually. The output is taken from a capacitor, C0 here. And that capacitor has a voltage across it. In fact, we know that voltage equals the total charge divided by the capacitance. And I can change the charge in that capacitor using the charge pump. And the way the charge pump works is when this switch is closed, I'm injecting current and thereby injecting charge, and then the voltage is going up. If I open that switch and then close this switch, I can take charge out of the capacitor. If I take charge out of the capacitor, then the voltage is going down. So we see by setting one of these two switches, I can either increase the amount of charge or decrease the amount of charge in the capacitor. That's what we mean by a charge pump. And by changing the charge in the capacitor, I'm changing the voltage, and that's the signal that gets sent out. So now the question is, how do I set these switches? Well, obviously, I want this switch to be set when I want the output voltage to go up. And that means the phase of one waveform is bigger than the other waveform. And then obviously I want this switch to be set whenever I see the opposite condition, when the other uh, waveform has a phase which is larger than the first waveform. And here's one simple way to do it. This is the phase frequency detector. In this case, we're using simple flip-flops indicated here. And those flip-flops are simply just measuring the amount of overlap between the waveforms. So a simple way of seeing what's going on here is to imagine that we have square waves, which we typically do because the output of the divider will frequently be a square wave. And then we've got another square wave here. And what this thing is doing, if you do a simple analysis of the circuit, is it's measuring the overlap in these square waves. And so if they're perfectly overlapped, they're in phase, and the extent to which one lags or leads the other, they're out of phase, and then you're throwing one of these two switches. So it's a very simple idea, uh, quite a bit of electronics, but it takes up a small amount of space in an integrated circuit. So it's a quite practical way to do this. Now previously I described the integer N PLL, and the limitation in the integer N PLL is step size. In other words, you get this discrete list of frequencies, and often the space between those selectable frequencies is too large. So a way to address that is using a fractional N PLL. So to describe that, I'll start off with the integer N diagram and just say what's different about it. What's different about it is that you choose, instead of a fixed value of N, you let N alternate between N and then n plus 1. So some fraction of time will divide by n, and the remaining fraction of the time will divide by n plus 1, and then we'll go back. So we alternate between n and n plus 1. This is referred to as dual modulus. So the reason this works is because the effective value of n, if you choose a small enough period for this cycling back and forth, is somewhere between n and n plus 1. In other words, if you just choose n, then you get an integer n PLL. If you choose n plus 1, then you get the different frequency, but still behaves like an integer n PLL. But if I choose n 10% of the time, and n plus 1 90% of the time, then I'll get some frequency which is intermediate to the values that these two things would otherwise choose. So that's the scheme.
And in this way, I get much finer tuning. I'm no longer limited by this step size, F ref divided by R. The trade-off is twofold. First, I have some complexity here because I have to implement a circuit which switches between N and N plus 1 according to a schedule. And that switching has to be fairly fast. Otherwise, I'll see the frequency switching. I need to implement the switching back and forth fast enough so that the actual discrete choice of frequencies here is not apparent and I get the average. Of course, the switching back and forth leads to spurious as well. By spurious, I mean additional spectral content in addition to the sinusoid that I'm trying to produce. And that additional spectral content is associated with the switching. So speaking of phase noise, this is what the phase noise of a fractional N PLL uh, looks like. This is an actual measurement from an actual uh, PLL synthesizer. In this case, it's generating a minus 13 dBm tone at 3 gigahertz. And 3 gigahertz is just off to the left here. And I'm showing uh, the spectrum starting 10 kilohertz to the right of the center frequency. And the reason is because the phase noise here is actually quite low in terms of power spectral density. So the peak of the waveform is off the top of the slide here quite a bit. But once I'm 10 kilohertz out, I see I am here. That's about minus 88 dBc per hertz. That means that in one hertz, I am down 88 dB relative to the carrier power or the power in the sinusoid. And then this is very typical here. We see roll off the phase noise, and then there's some leveling off, and there's additional roll off here. And this particular shape is very well known and recognized. We're not going to say exactly how this comes about, but it's a, a, a very typical kind of shape. What I want to point out here is the spurious, and the spurious is all these things, all these tones sticking up. These are all associated with the fractional N technique. If we had an integer N synthesizer, we would certainly have fewer of these and uh, perhaps uh, none of them would be apparent. So one of the trade-offs in going from integer n to fractional n is this increase in spurious. Now this plot makes it look a little bit worse than it is. And the reason is because each one of these tones has a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of power relative to the power in the intended frequency. And you can tell that right away from the numbers here. This is 90 dBc per hertz. So if I manage to get all the carrier power in one hertz, then the power associated with this spurious tone here is down by 90 dB, and that's, that's quite a bit. Nevertheless, there are some applications where these things are hard to live with. And in particular, in higher order digital modulations, these things can become problematic. So, as always, a trade-off. Integer N, coarse tuning, good spurious, fractional N, finer tuning, but additional spurious that has to be dealt with. The final technique I want to talk about is the Direct Digital Synthesis Technique, or DDS. In DDS, what we have is a digital analog converter. What we do is we generate the waveform as a digital signal. And then we feed that digital signal to the D to A converter. And the D to A converter produces the analog version of that waveform. So if we want to create a tone, for example, or a sinusoid, well, we can make sinusoids here, feed it to the DAC, and the DAC gives us out an analog waveform. Now there's one additional issue here, which you hopefully know from a previous class. If I use a DAC to create a digital signal, let's say this is the spectrum of my digital signal, this is F, and this is PSD, power spectral density, then of course I'm using a certain sample rate to do that, F sub S, and I create aliases as a result of that. So I get copies of that signal uh, at multiples of the sample uh, rate. And these signals are potentially full strength, so I really need to apply some kind of filter to eliminate all those aliases. And that's what this thing is about. That's the anti-aliasing filter. And then, of course, I need a clock to make this whole process happen. The clock has to be fed to the sample generator so it knows how to produce the samples or what rate to produce the samples. And then I need that same clock to go to the DAC because the DAC needs to be operating at the same rate. And this could quite easily be an XO, a crystal oscillator. It might be a PLL synthesizer uh, or something else. So there is frequency synthesis going on here as well, uh, even within the DDS. Different ways to make this, uh, these samples that are coming out of the sample generator. One is the approach that 
most naturally comes to mind, the waveform table. So if you want to make a sinusoid, what you do is you just say, well, I need to sample this at a certain rate. And those are the samples. And then these are the values that I'm going to pull off. And that set of values is the waveform table. And then, of course, I have to be very, very careful to get it right. So if this is the last sample in the table, then the first sample of the table better be the one that should appear over here. Uh, if I don't do that, then I get some glitch, and that's, of course, uh, would be disastrous. Another approach is CORTIC, which is an acronym. The idea is it's a relatively simple way to create a sinusoid, or the samples associated with the sinusoid, without actually listing them all out. So the hassle with this is you need memory to do that. And uh, in CORTIC, you can do it just with calculations. So it's a simple way to generate a sinusoidal signal in a way that doesn't require having a table of values in advance. So often students see this scheme and they say, well, wait a minute, why shouldn't we just do that uh, for everything? It seems like a remarkably flexible, remarkably uh, simple and uh, modern way to do frequency synthesis. Well, there are, as always, trade-offs. One is that digital analog converters have frequency limits. And in the year 2016, we can certainly go up to gigahertz or gigasamples per second sampling. Uh, and that's good. But the higher the sample rate, the bigger the power consumption. So in fact, this is a relatively uncommon thing to do. There are certainly some systems which use direct digital synthesis, namely those that benefit from this very high performance that you get from the digital processing. But most applications don't actually need that and these two things just uh, get in the way. So direct digital synthesis is currently kind of a Cadillac method. Uh, you use it when you really need the performance or you have some really compelling reason to, uh, to implement it, but in most cases it's, it's not used for these reasons. What I should say is that DDS increasingly commonly appears in hybrid synthesizers. And what do I mean by that? Well, perhaps we use DDS in lieu of a crystal oscillator. Now, when I say that, DDS probably contains a crystal oscillator, but maybe in a PLL synthesizer, I have a DDS unit, which is creating the reference frequency. That's a not uncommon thing to do. Or maybe I use the DDS in lieu of a voltage controlled oscillator. That's a, also a not uncommon thing to do. So uh, hybrid synthesizers consists of multiple technologies, maybe combining DDSs with VCOs or DDSs with crystal oscillators and so on. This concludes this lecture on variable frequency synthesis.